All right, we're paddling into another episode. We're here with the one and only Jeffrey Moore. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Nice to be here, Scott. Appreciate it. So the first question that I have is this book that you just recently wrote, it's an interesting title, The Infinite Staircase. Um, what is the universe, what the universe tells us about life, ethics, and mortality? What made you decide to write this book? It seems like a pretty big departure of your previous books. That would be true. That would be true. I think, well, so what did uh, stimulate me? I think part of it's been, um, I'm, I've done a lot of reading in a bunch of areas all my life. I, I, I read a bunch in physics. I read a bunch in biology. I'm an English major. I read a bunch in in, in literature, I got fascinated with Darwinism and the social sciences, and you know, at various times in, in my life, and and, and, they, and, they, and I kind of try to incorporate some of that into my into my business books, and uh, particularly Darwinism, I think had a pretty big influence on how I thought about markets and how markets evolve, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, the the, the whole intellectual backlog was just sitting there, and you know, you get and then I get older, and I'm seventy five years old. You're thinking, okay, I'm in the fourth quarter of the game. Do I want to write anything at this point about, you know, where we are in the game? And I kind of did. I wanted to step back and say, so, you know, what do you think, what do you think you've learned? And, and so the two questions I was going to try to answer were, what's going on? I mean, if philosophers would say, what is reality? I would just call it, but what's going on? And then second of all, and, and, and build on the science stuff. I mean, use the science as, as a foundation for that. And then given that picture of the world, which I was just piecing together from various bits and pieces that I'd read, um, how should we act? What, what, what's our ethical position in, in that world? Because ethics used to come from religion. This narrative was not a religious narrative. So, so now what? So the, it, it was, a, you know, whenever I write any book, I try, to, I try to think about a problem that I think is really interesting and I do not know the answer to, and then try to use the book as a way of building an answer to it. So that's what I was doing with the infinite staircase. So for those of you that are listening, many of you know exactly who Jeffrey Moore is, but maybe let's take a step back. Cause I'm curious, did your previous writings inform any of this going forward? And if you could just tell us a little bit, just a quick backlog of your history um, and the books you've written, and then maybe bridge the gap. If there is one cross the chasm uh, from marketing <laughs> to metaphysics. <laughs> okay. Deal. deal. I'll try to do this pretty quickly. But uh, so a lot of people don't know this. My first career was as an English professor. I have a PhD in medieval and Renaissance English literature. And I had a really strong interest in humanities and, and narratives and how narratives inform our lives. And that is going to carry over into marketing because marketing, as you know, is, is, is really about narratives and stories. So it's a whole lot about it. Um, I was a professor for four years. We were in a small college in Michigan. We wanted to live back in California. We just made the move. And there were no openings in academics, so I got a job in a software company. And that subsequently led to jobs in sales, which I was good at opening and not very good at closing. And that turned out to be an opening for marketing, because marketing is mostly about the opening part. So that was where I kind of found my, my niche. And I, and I joined a company called Regis McKenna, which was the premier high-tech marketing firm of the 80s. And that let me see a lot of clients all at once because it, it, virtually every major tech company was there at one point during the, the five years I was there. And that let me write my first book, business book called Crossing the Chasm. And Crossing the Chasm is still in print 30 years later. It's had, it's been, I've had to update it twice because you need to bring an all-new company examples so that people can relate to companies that they're familiar with. But the book hasn't changed. It's sold over a million, maybe close to two million copies. It's been in a lot of different languages. It kind of was my claim to fame, you know, my version of. I have a know. copy right okay. here. My original copy. I just looked at it and I found in there when, when I did my dot com startup, it has the business card. I'm like, I haven't seen this for years. My VC actually made me read this. This is part of the required reading. And I think that's across the board. Anyone in dot com. This was the Bible. <laughs> for so, sure. okay. so that was Sorry, I didn't interrupt yeah. you, but I'm like, yeah. No, no, it's great. Well, thank you, thank you. So anyway, so that that was kind of that was kind of my you know um, I we I can't get no satisfaction song. That was my that was my hit song. So then it led to a subsequent books. There were actually there are actually eight business books. Um, they are all backward compatible though, which is kind of interesting. Meaning the second book is compatible. Second book is called Inside the Tornado. Was okay. You've crossed the chasm. Now how do you deal with hyper growth? The third one was called The Gorilla Game. It was about investing in high tech. Book, book, book. 
each book was trying to take on a problem that actually had come to light in light of the prior book. So you work with a book. You What happens when you write a book is, as you know, you, you people say, well, you should give a speech about that. So you say, okay, I'll give a speech about that. And then somebody at the speech comes up to you and says, you know, this is really interesting. You should come and talk to my company about this. So you come and talk to their company about that. And they say, you know, this is really, we'd like to apply your ideas, but you should help us do that. So you say, okay, I'll consult with you. So now you're doing a consulting project. And in the middle of the project, they bring up a whole bunch of issues that you had no idea, never covered in the book. Where, you know, it's like, oh, crap, I, I got I to gotta write another book. <laughs> and so, and so, it's, it's, it, and then so they were it's, built on each other? Is that the way yeah. to say yeah. Each one, each one, each book essentially grew out of limitations or things that came to light in the light of the prior book that didn't get answered properly. And so Beautiful. it just was kind of a cascading set. Is of, it kind of like a staircase? <laughs> it's kind of like a staircase. staircase. Of course, I'm really into staircases. Even before the infinite the staircase, I love a, mar- a marketing. There's a, I have a marketing framework idea called Stairway to Heaven, which you by the way, if you use, you end up getting rock songs for the rest of your life. But the idea was just, uh, you know, when you're dealing with something that's technologically innovative, it, uh, the early adopters are all over it, but the but the majority are not. So you want to show them kind of a stairway of saying, well, here's where you are today. Here's probably your next step. Next step. It's kind of like the, what they used to call a maturity model. And you sort of put that out there and it was always a staircase. And so staircases were always in the back of my mind. And then the thing that happened with, with the philosophy book, although in the last book, I'll just say Zone to Win, is crossing the chasm for people in large publicly held companies who need to maintain their existing line of business and still want to catch the next wave, and which turns out to be a very different problem than if you're a startup catching the next wave. And so that was, that was, that was the last one. But then, then the Infinite Staircase came along, and what, what, what happened was I thought, well, you know... These frameworks, I've been doing frameworks my whole life about how do you solve kind of tough problems with frameworks. Why don't you take on the toughest, um, go 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 big, <laughs> go big or go home is what one of the recent books said. So that's what made me want to say, okay. And the problem was there's really, really good material on various stairs in the staircase. Like the first stair is physics. There's a ton of great, about the Big Bang and astrophysics. And these are, I'm not a physicist by any stretch of the imagination. So these are generalist books, but they're really good. And then and there's some really cool stuff about microbiology and all the, well, all the COVID MNRA. I mean, all this stuff is going on. Really good stuff about that. And there always was good stuff about, about Darwinism and how do you apply evolutionary thinking to development of people. And then I had all this humanities background. So I sort of had, I had a lot of pieces, but those disciplines don't talk to each other. And so they were kind of siloed together. And I thought, well, if you're going to build a coherent picture of reality, you really need to draw on all of them. And so the thing that pulled it all together was some ideas out of the Santa Fe Institute around what they call emergence and complexity. And their whole vision of reality is reality is a staircase. I would use a staircase. They probably just say a set of emerging layers of complexity, each of which draws on what's below it but also presents new properties that you could never have predicted from what's below. And so I tried to think about, well, how would you build a staircase stair at a time? And so there's 11 stairs in the book. And the claim of the book is each stair is in the right place. That You start with physics and you end with theory. And, and, then, and then, so that was two thirds of the book, which was just like, could you build a coherent picture of reality that, you know, sort of made sense and drew on the best thinking that I've been able to, tap into uh, the bibliography's got probably, I don't know, 200 books in it. I don't know, a lot of books in it because Kindles can hold a lot of books and I stand. Mm-hmm. With, by the way, a Kindle is a gift if you sleep with someone and you don't want to wake them up in the middle of the night when you want to read. So it's, that's when most of this reading gets done. Anyway, so then the last third, just to close, was, but, you know, I wasn't a liberal arts professor. I care about people you know, embracing ideas to make them live better. And so the last third was about ethics. And it was about, you know, how do traditional ethics, because I have a very traditional ethical system. I mean, basically, I mean, I, I, was, I, wasn't, I, didn't, I wasn't a religious family, but I certainly inherited the entire Christian, Judeo-Christian tradition. And kind of, I still to this day, I'm very loyal to it. But, but if you, if, how do you derive that from a big bang as opposed to from, you know, Genesis? And so that was, and then, and then how, how much, how do you authorize ethics and how do, what do you, what do they stand for? So that was the last third of the book. 
So the ethics is interesting to me big time because, you know, you think about business and the importance of ethics and trust and, and now more than ever in this world in business, like that seems to be something that's like, it may be even a competitive advantage. Um, was there any correlation between the writing of, of all your business books and, and you outlining this, I don't know, uh, framework of framework and it being sort of like a playbook for really not just how to live your life and be aware of how the world works, but like how business can function or is it, I mean, that's kind of how I'm reading through it a little bit, but I'm just like, well, you know, it's, it's kind of prescient of you because I would say that one of the relationships that developed in the last 10 years for me that had a big impact and ultimately I think led me to write the book was with Mark Benioff at Salesforce. And Mark sort of exemplifies the kind of business leadership you just said. So Salesforce does have a competitive advantage because of their ethics. They, they, they really do. Now, you know, like anything else, you can become a larger company. You have to be careful not to, you know, take anything for granted. But, but, but it was there. And Mark lives his ethics out much more completely. I mean, I always kept my, the internal ethics separate from the external. I wanted it to be ethical, but I didn't. I didn't want to proselytize. I didn't want to like, you know, I didn't want to be a guru. I didn't want to like, you know, preach to the, you know, to the world. Uh, and Mark doesn't preach, but, but he, he's out there with, and I thought, you know, he's showing up a lot more powerfully than I am in his area. And I could show up more powerfully. And, and he kind of challenged me to do it anyway. And so that's what led me I to say, okay, smart guy. So write the damn book. I mean, just do it. Mm-hmm. See what happens. Because, you because my 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 interpretation of you is you look at these patterns you see and and demystify them or the the things that create possibility and create frameworks so people can really go okay I can understand it and I can actually move forward with it so is this book in the same way can you describe absolutely, like the- yeah absolutely yeah this is I mean crossing the chasm was the the, the very first problem was. Why can these startups have, with these really cool prob, uh, products have this amazing impact when they first launch and then go off the radar? And like, what was going on? And, and, because, and, and, and so the first framework was called the technology adoption life cycle. And I just said, look, it's a break in the life cycle, people. There's this thing called the chasm. And, and, and the early adopters are on one side of it and everybody else is on the other side. And crossing the chasm is a is a isolatable marketing problem that you need to understand how to do better because you're not doing it right. We're just losing everybody in the chasm. So, so you could kind of, so now fast forward to this last book. Well, we have this really cool secular understanding of the universe, but we have a past political leader who is essentially debunking truth and debunking integrity and debunking honesty and debunking anything, everything I stand for. And, and, and the culture has no obvious way to call them on it. And it's like, that's, that's not okay. So, so how do you authorize ethics in a secular culture was a very important motive for me to sort of you know, do that. And, 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 so, and so the idea behind the book is this is all about strategies for living. And ethics is a class of strategies for living that has been proved very successful in many cultures across many time spans. And it has authority by virtue of its prior success. And people who, who abuse ethics or have also shown up through history many, many times, but in general have not had the success and have caused an enormous amount of grief. And so, you know, there's a way to, there's a way to sort of tie traditional ethics to a secular understanding of the world that is pretty credible. At least I've tried to make it as credible as I can. Is this in conflict with religion in any way? I don't think so. I mean, the, the key, the, the interesting staircase where this book comes together with religion is called narrative. And so, I, and I make the claim, because I'm an English major, now be careful. I make the claim that narrative does all the heavy lifting for human problem solving. And so religion is a whole class of narratives. The challenge for religion in a modern day is religions tend to be based on sacred texts and sacred texts are not to be modified, which means there's a, an inherent static element to a religious narrative that that's becomes increasingly problematic. And what, what religious people do is they, they, they resort to allegory and interpretation and what they call hermeneutics. They find ways to try to keep it perennially relevant. And you can do that. 
But there's this other narrative that, that is incredibly extraordinary, which it starts with a big bang, which is just crazy. And, and, and the narrative of how you get from 13.8 billion years ago to Scott and Jeff talking you know, on a podcast, how do you do that without any miracles intervening is more miraculous than any religious narrative I've ever read. So, so I mean, but, but it's a narrative. And so that's where I, that's where they came together. Is it really, is they're really just an intersection. I don't see one without the other really. Well, I think the thing, the thing about, it's very interesting. I talk to a lot of people who say I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's capturing a lot of the modern challenge, the, 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 the modern sensibility, at least, and I think if I include myself in this group, says I totally honor religious narratives, but but I, I honor them as stories, as opposed to honoring them as archaeology or as, as history. I mean, as, as sort of uh, as science. And, and so and so and I don't like separating science from narrative because I think, and you know, you and I both live in the world of. I mean, the world of marketing is the world of narrative. Uh, and so, so, and so I didn't want to isolate it that way. Um, so anyway, that, but, uh, just, but I also didn't want to, uh, trap these dialogue into you either have to, what I wanted to do is I said, could you, could you present a case for ethics that did not depend upon religious belief? It didn't say you couldn't have religious belief, but it said Independent of religious belief, can you create this? The, the, can you get to this set of ethics? And that's what I was trying to do in the last third of the book. Beautiful, and you know, like you've talked about, you you draw upon Darwinism for a lot of business model thinking, correct? And one of the things of, is evolution, you know, change, um, and as it pertains to business, it's always changing. And the one thing that struck me from your book was entropy and the idea of death, and it actually fueling um, sustain and, and growth and continuation. And, and, you know, this podcast is really about sustainable marketing or sustainable ideas. And, you know, I, and I, I never really thought about what, you know, what you were saying there. And it kind of struck me because if I think in marketing and business, it's like, is there an application for this, you know, in this thinking? Because again, I'm kind of, kind of mapping it back a little bit to my reality of marketing and business and trying to apply a little bit to your book. So forgive me. Um, but I'm thinking about like Volkswagen. It The bug died and then it came back. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so can you describe a little bit your thinking about entropy and well, its okay, application so there's, to there's, this there's, and there's, maybe there's business? Actually, I think actually I would do, let me do death instead of entropy because I think it relates more to what your point was. So the last chapter in the book is called, is called Being Mortal. And it starts, you know, of course, you know, we're, we're all born with a fear of death. I mean, that's kind of how mammals stay alive, right? But, you know, I, I say, so is there anything that, that Darwinism could say about death that would be in any way, you know, kind of a platform for going forward? And it's going to relate to the Volkswagen's death as well. And so I said, well, look, <clears throat> what Darwin says is that we're a product of evolution. And it says evolution is the result of natural selection, right? So we're here because of natural selection. Natural selection is the result of life and death competitions, right? So if there were no death, there would be no natural selection. If there's no natural selection, there'd be no evolution. If there was no evolution, there'd be no us. And everything that you and I experience, and none of it would exist. We would be, I guess we would have a world of just lots of bacteria. <laughs> because, I don't know what it would be. Right, but because would, there's no narrowing process exactly, to the most no, advanced... It'd be like a socialism for business, like all businesses treat the same, no competition to make it better. Exactly. And so, and so, and so therefore, you know, you started saying, you know, instead of saying death is the enemy, which, which we know as an organism, you really are raised to, to feel that way and be that way. And by the way, when you lose anybody you love to death, it, it's, it's a serious, it's a seriously crushing experience. But, but if you step back from that and say, but hell, I mean, if it weren't for death, we wouldn't be here in the first place, which is really, I mean, I think embracing the truth of that sentence was an important moment for me. I thought, shit, there's no other way to get here. And, and so it's like, whoa. So, so, I, so I couldn't demonize it because that didn't seem quite fair. So, so then it was, well, how do you go at it? And, and, and that's where it gets back to Volkswagen too. So what I said about was, okay, so you're mortal. And by the way, as I said, I'm 75. I'm going to say a game, you know, 100, 100, minutes seems, 100 years seems like a, a pretty long football game. So fourth quarter, right? But, but you know, you want to, you know, you still want still time on the clock. 
and uh, you know you're still in the game. So what do you want to do? And and I think what you want to do is you want to you want to honor a legacy. I at least I would like to leave a legacy, and I'd like to have impact in in a positive way. I think the Volkswagen people felt the same way. You know, they had they had their their first Volkswagen, my crossing the chasm thing. God bless, you know. And then you know it it had its day, but then other things displace it. Uh, and then the question is, okay, now what are you going to do? And what and the thing is, when you've been successful once, you have a lot to bring back to the table if you if you have the energy and the will to do it. You have to sort of leave your ego at the door, uh, but but you can you can really have a big impact, and that seems like the best thing to do. At least that's certainly what I want to do. Yeah, it's like they went back to the origins, which is sort of like going back and honoring the past, if you will, and that's a little cyclical. Um, in your sort of Darwinism theory, or in the um, I'm thinking about the whole thing you said about desire. When I saw that on the staircase, I was like, that wasn't, I wasn't expecting that because desire is like, can you explain that a little bit? Because sure. it's okay. And maybe, so, so, maybe give people a little context of the stairs. Yeah, yeah, Cause I'm kind staircase. of, I have the so, ability of reading the book. Yeah. So. Okay. So the staircase idea is simply that each level of reality emerges from the one below it. So the, the bottom stair that I dealt with was physics. I said, look, you know, 13.8 billion years ago, there was nothing. And then there was just physics. And there's, by the way, there was just physics for quite a long time. There wasn't, chemistry doesn't, can't happen until you have atom, electrons bonding with protons to make atoms and chemical reactions. That doesn't happen until, you know, I, I think it's like 400,000 years. I mean, it's a while. Okay. And, and so then, so then, but then you get to the next most interesting thing for human beings is Earth. Earth shows up about 4.6 or 7 billion years ago. But interestingly, life on Earth shows up very within like within less than a billion years. And and so what, what was that life? Well it was essentially bacteria. There was kind of it's called archaeons, but they're like bacteria. Single cell things. So you say, well how the hell did that happen? And 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 so that that, that the first three was called the metaphysics of entropy. And I talk about how entropy is the is, is the force that unites those three. It's, it's a complicated argument, so I don't think I'll try to reconstruct it right now. And it's it's for geeks. If, if, if for those of you who are listening to this show, if you like geeky science, you're going to love this chapter. If you don't, you should skip the chapter. <laughs> but the next chapter to what Scott said starts with, OK, now you have single cell life on the planet. How do you get from that to you and me? And so the idea was, well, you have single cells. What's what happens? Well, they start creating these multicellular things that look a lot like tissues. And part of the way they operate is they signal to each other. In other words, one cell will emit a chemical that causes another cell to do something that helps the first cell. So they it's sort of like, I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch my back. So that that intercellular communication is the first is is the first inclination of something that I'm going to end up calling desire. And, and desire is simply the the mind experiencing the intercellular chem, chemical communication that's going on inside your body. And, and when you're a little baby, you have no language, you have no culture, you have no mental faculties that we would recognize as you know, mind, but you do experience desire and you do experience fulfillment. And so the, the desire fulfillment thing is what then leads to consciousness emerging at some point, because prior to, I mean, if you go back in time, I can have desire and fulfillment, but if I just do it blindly, which is how it began, at some point, if any organism gets any, any leg up, on fulfillment over the other guys because they have any any kind of don't even call it consciousness just one men, just one signal advantage that they can detect motion they can detect a they can do anything they're going to beat out the other guy and so they're going to be they're they're going when we propagate their genes they're going to be more of them and less of the other guys and then is that when you called it attention with in, or attention with intention yes exactly okay. at this point what happens is you you you. Uh, your attention is born out of intention and the intention is I need to fulfill the desire. And so conscious, and this, by the way, this is kind of what David Hume was saying when he said, look, you know, reason is the, is the servant of passion, not the master of passion. It was that idea of look, desire pulls us into the world and then we use our minds in order to fulfill desires more effectively and, and, and going forward. And, and then I'm, and that, so that second section goes desire, consciousness, values, and culture all before language. And it's an important idea because values, and this is where we tie into the second half of the book, values happen before language. 
and, and I make the claim that they arise in mammals, to some degree in birds, but mostly in mammals, because mammals nurture their young. And so what you and I, the first year of our lives, we experienced total dependence on another being. And that, uh, that being every single day tended to our needs, or we wouldn't be here because you can't survive as a baby without that. So you are born, and by the time you're in your second year of your life, you have internalized what we call love because you couldn't be here if you, had, if you hadn't received that. Now, you know, you can receive it in all kinds of contexts and some of which are unhappy and there's all of the things that can happen. But, but anyway, the nurturing, the way mammals nurture uh, uh, babies and then our, the social nature of mammals creates, you know, the, not only the relationship with the mother, but the relationship with the father and then with siblings and then with the, you know, the tribe and whatever. But all of that is socializing values. And you see those values in deer and in dogs and in cats and in and chimpanzees. I mean, you don't need people to have values. The values, are, the early values are there. And even culture, like you, you see the, the monkeys teach the, the, how to use the twig to fish for the ants and the, you know, the whatever, the, 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 the otters that crack open the muscle with a rock on their chest, or all that kind of stuff. That's, those are strategies for living that are learned not genetically. They're learned through imitation. And in other words, one animal sees another animal do it and goes, ha ha, that looks like a pretty cool idea. I, I mean, they don't say that, but, but, they, but they imitate it. And, 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 if, and the ones that successfully imitate it create a tribe that have this as a behavior that they pass on generation to generation to generation. It's that tribe's culture. And so I wanted to make the point that values and culture, because those are kind of the core of ethics and at the core of how we think about ethics, arise prior to language. They don't, the, 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 the sort of the payoff line is our values do not come from above. They come from below. And I wanted to show them emerging out to that. And then the last third of the book is then you get language. And then we go, I call it going from the metaphysics of genes to the metaphysics of memes, you know, ideas. And then that was the last third of the book. By the way, that genes to memes. So yeah. when I read that chapter and I read it, I laughed because I thought it was kind of funny because you, you have a couple little funny points in, in several chapters, like your, you know, best defense, like the 85 Chicago Bears or something that made me chuckle. <laughs> So I read that, and I actually thought you meant from genes to from genes to memes, like social media memes. And yes, then I yes. read it, and then I laughed hard at myself because so I'm like, "Well, of course he wouldn't say that. This makes no sense." <laughs> but that's where my brain went right away. Just so you know, I thought that was kind of funny. Well, I was well, laughing. It's, it's great. I, I'm glad. <laughs> okay. So, anyways, um, okay. So we got this infinite staircase. Why is this important to know? Like, what? Sure to thy own self be true and to know the world around you. That's a really important thing. Is, is, is there a connection between someone who's like, who's been following you and reading you in your business? Could they apply this staircase to really like re sort of like realign this understanding of the universe so that they can create more, be more. Um, you talk about being, and I, and I think that's just interesting. Well, the, 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 let's set aside the chapter on being just for a second and go back to just the, I think the upper parts of the staircase are where people like you and I live with our clients. So basically, we live in a world which is incredibly language inflected and to the point where often people have trouble getting outside of their own language box. And, and what mindfulness is about is finding a way to reconnect with, with the world with, without using language because language can be so entrapping. Uh, and you have this whole tradition of, of French deconstruction, which was the ultimate in how to trap yourself in a language trap. It was just, it was just devastating. So anyway, so, but, but, ne- but the, two fra- the two things above language I talk about in particular are narrative and analytics. And, and narrative are the stories we tell that intuitively solve problems. And then analytics is criticizing those narratives in order to figure out which of those, nar- wh- where is this narrative true and where is it not true? And where can you use it and where can you not use it? And if you think about business, I mean, everything in business starts as a narrative. You know, there's a business plan. There's a, I have an idea for a product. I'm pitching a venture capitalist. I, when, when I, I, I spend my monies in a, in a VC firm. So guess what? You know, people come in and they tell you a story. And, 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 and yes, there's a little bit of like there's a spreadsheet typically somewhere in that story. It's the least credible thing in the whole story. I mean, there's no facts for that spreadsheet. They just made up numbers. But, but what there is is a, is a story. And so, and so the storytelling, so understanding, and I've spent the last 10 years in particular with clients saying, 
you need to be clear about your narrative. You, 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 you enlist people through your narrative. You, you hold yourself accountable to the narrative. If, if you're worried about retention, if you're worried about talent acquisition, if you want to, if you want, if you're, if you're somebody of my generation trying to understand millennials, you better get in touch with the narrative. And so, so that's part one. Then part two is, and you need to criticize the narrative. Every narrative is a limited artifact. It has it has its strong points and its weak points, and it's not okay to demonize the strong points, but it's also not okay to overlook the weak points. You gotta, you really gotta, and and, and so I would argue that that literary criticism, but also marketing analysis, is about critiquing narratives to make them more effective. Um, and, and yeah, so yeah. So then you have analytics and theory. Yes. So tell me a little the bit more analy- about that. The analytics part is the critical part. Then the theory was, the theory is, is okay, that's, that now we're getting to a level where you really have to be a theory person to want to do theory because you can live perfectly fine and perfectly functional and be very powerful in the world and not have an ounce of interest in theory. But if you're, with my particular disposition, maybe yours as well, it's like, yeah, but I would like to figure out how does all this fit together really? And so that's what I was trying, that, that was what I was trying to do. I just, yeah. and it, 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 part of it was just kind of a reality check of, are you just bullshitting or can you actually fit this thing together? And so the, the, uh, the staircase was the, was the me- mechanism, the framework for saying, and the claim of the staircase is pretty bold, actually. It's saying there are 11 stairs. I didn't say that there couldn't be other ones, but I said these 11 are all part of reality and they're in the right order. Meaning every single stair in this staircase depends on the stairs below it and does not depend on the ones above it. And that turned out, you know, the, half of the time you think, well, duh. And half the time it's like, really? And, and so it, it was, that was, that was, I think that's what I wanted to get. The, the theory test was to sort of solidify that and see if that could hold. Beautiful. This book is so interesting. Um, I have to read it again. It's, it's a, it's definitely like you've, it's so well written, but for me, I just feel like I couldn't, I, I wanted to reread uh, things and I'm still trying to understand, you know, exactly like just digest. It's not a book you can just like rip through. I was on my Kindle, like you said, at night and uh, <laughs> it's not a, 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 a quick read, if you will, but it's an easy read to understand. That's what I love about it. So let's do a little bit of a term and, okay. and let's just talk about, you've got this long career, storied career in marketing and with tech companies and this, this, this great new book. And we were talking just before about this intersection of spirituality business. And I noticed one of the things that you said in your book there is like you do some, you've tried or you do, or you have done transmetal uh, meditation. I can't even say what it is. What is it called again? It's called transcendental meditation or just TM for people that do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So TM, what is that? And and tell us a little bit about that. And then I got to follow up with a little bit of that. Sure. Okay. Well, I think the contemporary the contemporary word for TM is the generic term is mindfulness. Uh, transcendental meditation actually showed up in the '60s. There was a guy named Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. He became famous because the Beatles and Donovan and Mia Farrow and a bunch of people, uh, you know, uh, bought into it. And it had it had there was a Maharishi University. It was so in the '60s. It was quite a it, was, it had quite a big deal. And then it kind of faded from view. But you know, Maria and I, uh, we, we both learned transcendental meditation back in the '60s. And never stopped. So I've been meditating every day for 50 years. So it's doing it. So, and I think the way a, a, a person should think about that is like doing mindfulness. You know, and mindfulness is typically done with your breathing. It's, it's it, any, anybody can do it. And the point about it is what, you know, when I was, it, when I was learning about meditation, I thought it was going to be hard to do. I thought, you know, this is going to be like Zen and it's going to be, you know, the master and only the really the most enlightened person is going to get this thing. It's actually this particular transcendental meditation and mindfulness are the exact opposite of that. It is there is absolutely no way to get better at it. it. All you're doing is taking your awareness just to your breathing or to a mantra to whatever it is, and just letting your mind go. And then a moment or two later, you're thinking about something when you realize, oh, I sh- I want to be put my awareness back on the like in TM they call it the mantra, in mindfulness they call it your breathing. Just bring it back to that, and that's it. You, you, there's there, there, there's nothing to it, but what happens is over time by doing this over time, is you get more and more familiar with the quieter parts of your mental experience, and 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 the, I would call the pre linguistic parts of your uh, 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 experience, 
and it just it just it, it's very it's centering. It, it has all the all those spiritual words that you that you hear about that you that we all want. They all come from that that place. And so, and if you just do this stuff routinely after a while, it's like, well, it's just part of you. And, uh, and it's not, and because and, and, I, I, I love the transcendentalists and I love the romantic poets, but they were all about having these amazing experiences, which I totally resonated with, but they weren't excess. I mean, it's like you, you couldn't plan them. You, you couldn't rely on them. And, and so what I loved about meditating was it was totally accessible and totally reliable. And it was like, Okay, so that was huge. And that meant that the reason why it became the bridge, because I call that chapter being a bridge to ethics, because I don't think you can be ethical in the world and meet the challenges of being ethical in the world without spiritual energy. And so the main issue was, well, where the heck you, in a religion, it's obvious where you get spiritual energy from, right? You get it from God, you get it from prayer, you get it from whatever. But in a secular world, where do you get it from? Where does it come from? And so it was really important for me to have a chapter on, here's where I think it comes from. Mm -hmm. And in that space, so I do, I, I meditate every day. I use um, Tony Robbins priming, uh, okay. which is a breathing exercise that he does um, cool. uh, from Nepal. Some Do some special nice. breathing and then you focus on uh, three things you're grateful for. So it's a gratitude uh, and then three things you want to, you envision, you know, sharing your energy uh, to others. And then you end with three goals that you want to visualize. So it's visualization. So it's kind of a combination of multiple things. And I have found that over multiple days that um, consecutively, now that I do it as a practice, it has opened up doors, which has been part of what you and I were talking about before we were recording, which is this movement of mindful marketing. And, you know, and, and that's the guests that have been coming on, the things that have been just naturally um, I've been on clubhouses. I've been doing rooms on mindful marketing, and I can't believe the level of interest in this intersection where there, where people are going. I want to ethically build my business, but I want to do so in a way that's congruent with my values. And it, there just seems to be like such an appetite for this. That's why I think your book is just so amazingly timely right now, especially coming from you. When I saw this book, I was like, Jeffrey Moore, like this is so interesting. Um, what would you say about what you've seen? Because you've seen so much marketing and business over this time. And you have a bit of a bird's eye view, I think, where you could kind of see where the trends are going and, and what's what's happening here. Because well, you know, it's, what it, I, it, it's so interesting because when when I started marketing, uh, getting in sales and marketing, sales and marketing felt like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. You know, coffee yes. is for closers. And, and, and basically the implication was you kind of had to abandon some of the softer values if you were going to be successful at sales in particular. And even marketing, you had to sort of, you know, you don't have to tell the truth, tell them what, tell them what they want to hear and, you know, whatever. So that, and I, I would say that that, 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 that was, I don't think that was ever the only story in town, but that was, that was, I would say that was my received vision of, and certainly for coming as an academic to business, that was totally my perceived vision. I thought I was joining the Philistines. I thought I was going out among the, you know, whatever. So, so, <laughs> so then fast forward or not fast forward, go forward to an arc, the arc of my career in business has been about 40 years. What's happened is you've gone from a sales centric, product centric, sell them whatever it is, and then get out of town to a subscription-oriented uh, economy where, where retention and, and, and uh, uh, customer success has become incre incredibly important. In fact, the, the, the function customer success used to be called customer support, and prior to that, it was called tech support. And, and, and the, it shows that at the beginning, it, you, you would sell them anything, and the tech support guys had to do whatever they could to make it work, but the customer owned the monkey. The customer had to get value out. Now we've gone all the way to the other end of the spectrum, which is if your customer is not successful, your business is going to fail because in a subscription model, you cannot afford to acquire a customer and then lose them. You really have to have a long, what they call LTV, you know, the lifetime value of the customer. So all of a sudden, how do you keep a customer? Well, it turns out all these values that we're talking about are values that keep customers. And all the values that, all the violations of those values can get customers faster. In other words, that's why it worked in the 80s. You can get a customer faster, but you can't keep them. So you have to lock them in. So the, the, the 80s, 90s thing was get a customer, lock them into your architecture, and then abuse them for the rest of time. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and the new one is, no, give your customer, bring your customer in, you know, 
with with open, you know, open kind of any freemium, open any anything you can do. Let them let them join you gradually, but then treat them in a way that makes them not only want to stay with you, but actually want to evangelize you. Mm-hmm. So then you, you, you go to the point of these people are actually working, but all, but only, that only happens, as you said, when we were talking before, when you're in a community of trust and a community of mutual respect. And so, and, and so, you know, that's why you know, I, I my, as a citizen of the United States right now, what I'm so upset about is watching the systematic uh, spreading of distrust as a political technique to retain power. It, 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 and by the way, it, as, as we know, this is a very powerful technique. It has worked in, in the short term. It's worked very powerful in the past. In the long term, it's been horribly disastrous for every society that's embraced it. But in the short term, it, it, it's a very, very tough uh, uh, opponent. Yeah, very, a lot of things you said there. You know, And the one thing I would just say is I actually have some familiarity, even though I'm from Canada, because I actually worked on Tulsi Gabbard's uh, presidential run campaign and uh-huh. got a real, real taste of some of this uh, misinformation and, and some of the things you're referring to. Uh, when you're talking earlier, you were describing a little bit about mindfulness and, and, and the, the shift towards subscription models. And to me, I'm writing a book, I didn't mention that to you, um, called Groundswell. And, it, and the chapter I call it is, we're shifting from buy to buy in where people want to buy into you and the values and they're not no longer transacting on the value of the product. They want to know what you're doing with the profits of the company. They want to know the values that you espouse as a company and people are now not buying on price. They're buying on values. Do you think that's accurate? Well, I think, I think, I think it's a little bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, in some societies, I'm sure they're just buying on price because I just needed to survive but as you move up the hierarchy of needs and get into more developed economies, self-realization and, and actualization becomes increasingly important. And, and in a self-actualized individual, everything you said is incredibly important to them because they want their whole life to reflect their values. And, and not in an egotistical sense. I mean, I'm sure there's there's that too. There's the, you know, I have the brand genes that you don't have. That I'm not trying to do a Kardashian. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. talking more about people who say, look, I think people have embraced morta- their own mortality, maybe not as consciously as I was trying to do in that chapter. But I see all, I see all of this as, look, we're not going to be here forever. We need to live our lives in a way that, we, that honors our own lives. And we want our children to respect us. And we want our grandchildren. And we want our parents and our grandparents. So, so I, I think that, that all of that has both familial impact, but also has market impact. I mean, Back to your point, it, it, you know, and, and some of it, some of it is, is a little bit superficial. Like, you know, we, we started interrogating the supply chain and, you know, and did the ESG metric of my supplier, supplier path. At some point, I think, I, I think, come on, people, we're, 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 we're getting, we're getting in the weeds here. The, stay closer to the principle and the more immediacy of it. But the immediacy of it is, do not make me embrace values I don't believe in in order to use your products or services. And and that and I think we did, I think for a long time, well, you know, I mean, yeah, we, we know that cheap products were being created in parts of this world through slavery or the moral equivalent of slavery. And that, sh- that is wrong and we should not support that. I'm not sure if you've heard this quote. I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly. It's um, being an entrepreneur is really a self-development journey masked as a profit um, expedition. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Something like that. Oh, I love it. I love, yeah, yeah, yes, because you have so much, most of the creative energy is actually in yourself. Now, it's not, it has no value until you can put it into the world. But, but and if you're going to be, and, and part of the entrepreneurial personality is they just need, it's like an artist. You know, an artist needs to express themselves in their art. Well, an entrepreneur needs to express themselves in their entrepreneurial endeavor. And uh, and what's wonderful, and, and sometimes ludicrously so, I mean, you see these entrepreneurial ideas and you think, do not try this at home. But 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 <laughs> but it but it's the human spirit. And right. you say, God love it. <laughs> you know, so the, my lead to that is, you know, is business a spiritual journey? Because are we moving away from, like you said, the Glen Gary, Glen Ross? sell it at any price to really businesses are are there to 
make the world better and 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 help people and help them become their best version of themselves is is that i like to believe i'm an optimist but i kind of like to believe that well first of all you're acting on that and i'm going to act on that you and i are both you and i would not take on a client or do a project which contradicted what you just said we just wouldn't do it mm-hmm. and i think more and more people are of that of that persuasion is there a way in which you can do business that completely, you know, uh, blows up everything you and I've just said? Yes, there is. Yes. Uh, and, and, and is it powerful? Yes, it is powerful. Uh, so so I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that there's an optimist versus pessimist. But I, there are, there's a wonderful line in a poem by E.E. E. Cummings uh, about uh, Olaf. Uh, he's a conscientious objector at a time when the uh, conscientious objectors were just despised. And, and so they're, they're just brutally uh, persecuting this this person in this poem. But there's a line that he says, there is some shit I will not eat. And, you know, I'm thinking about that. And I'm thinking about the political situation in the United States right now. And I'm thinking, there's a large number of people that I don't know that they can say that sentence. And, but you and I, but, and, but I think a large of the people that we want the, the people, the person I'm trying to be, the person I think you're trying to be, and I think the people that are listening to this podcast in general are trying to be, is, well, there is for me. And, and there are a lot, and, and, and it's important. And it's not the only, I mean, the most important thing is one of the things you're doing, you know, it's not what you will die for, but what you will live for, right? I mean, that's the most important mm-hmm. thing. But there's there are guardrails, and those guardrails, I think, have to be respected. Yeah, it's like Simon Sinek, you know, if you, you need to stand for something. It's yes. not that you're always going to live in this, like, perfect ethical bubble, but at least having, a, a you know, something you're standing for that people want to get behind. And, and that is what I'm calling this, like, unseen wave of, of, of marketing, this groundswell, because it's a pull. Like, in a lot of the marketing that I've experienced, like, I look at the dot-com era and how many dead bodies there were because it was all about this rapid, fast growth. And nobody talks about, not everybody, it's not a very good both statement, the, the general lexicon or conversation or, or thinking then was fast growth equals growth, period, not healthy growth. But then you look at now at some of the businesses, like MicroStrategy, they were a slow and steady growth, and look where they are today. Like, and so I was curious about your you you have been part of this that whole yeah. curve, yeah, and yeah. for me, having been part of startups that died and all this kind of stuff, that's why I'm sort of really um, um, so focused on sustainable, healthy growth and and how it can create exponential outcomes if you do certain things that are maybe not sexy and maybe they're a little slower and. It kind of ties in with a lot of what you were saying in your book, which about ethics and and uh, morals and so forth being sort of like a, a natural compass. And I'm just curious, you know, in closing, yeah. a little bit more I, of that, your thoughts. Yeah, no, it's good. Because I, I, so I have a friend who used to call the time right before the bubble popped the time of the great happiness <laughs> because everybody, <laughs> yeah. everybody, you know, have, everybody's going to have a, have a foundation to deal with all the wealth they were going to have. So, so at that, time, I think there was a period, and I think bubbles are, are characteristic of this, where um, people are trying to score. So they're not in service to the world. They're not in service to themselves. They're, they're just trying to score, and and so that's that that's that's not evil, but it, but that's that will lead to that leads to bad outcomes. That leads to to you know a lot of very disappointed uh, failed startups. To your point, if you start something that in a, I mean, there's two issues. One is, what are you in service to, and is that worthy to be service to? The other, and by the way, that normally means, what problem in the world would you like to try to help take off the table? Then there's the other question: is what technology can you bring to the table that can change the dynamics of that problem to make it to make it solvable? And and, and so a lot of people come to entrepreneurialism with the first, the second one: I have this technology. What should I use it for? Mm-hmm. Um, which is which is fine if they can find the first one, but but uh, but a lot of the failed startups come with the second one and they never find the first one. So they just they have a they have you know this technology, but they can't ever quite figure out how to how to make it meaningful to the rest of the world. You know, a bunch of people come with the, a lot of, a bunch of NGOs come to the world with the first one, huge list of problems to solve, but they don't come with the second one. So they they actually 
they they raise money, they do everything, they try to palliate, they 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 do everything they can to help, but nothing they do scales. And and so what has been so exciting to me about the tech sector in particular in my lifetime is tech scales. And if you take an entrepreneur who genuinely embraces there's a problem in the world that I want to put my life and my company in service to, and I understand technology and how to scale things. And I, I think, you know, Bill Gates was the first person I ever met that actually blew my mind about scale. And then the Google guys blew my mind about scale. And, and then the Amazon web server blew my mind about scale. So my mind's basically in tatters um, because I just couldn't comprehend the scales that they were talking about. But now you're looking at people, I mean, like you, you Musk and Bezos saying, well, actually, you want to manufacture in space. <laughs> it's like, really? But the point is, they, there's a problem that they perceive, and there is a, a technology. And I mean, Elon Musk with electron, electric vehicles is a really good example of this, um, where they, he just operated at a scale that nobody imagined. It just nobody imagined. And so th that's... That's kind of amazing. When you when you have either one without the other, it's not that you can't do good work, but it's it's just not the same. Mm -hmm. Do you see like you're so intimate, or at least I'm understanding, anyways, with the world of venture capital because you grew up in Menlo Park and or you did a lot of your yeah. career there. And do you think you know VCs will look at this going, you know, instead of going, how much money will this make and how scale it'll be, is going. How much impact on the world will this be? But not from um, a purely like doing good in the world. Is that knowing that that could scale? If and, the, and let me just sort of kind of explain a little bit. Like I think about Facebook. You could say, oh, it scales. It's huge. It's massive. But ethical information management issues could implode it. Right? It could be yes. it'd be like a black yes. star in yes. my yes. mind. Yes. Exactly. And so you know what I talk about in the podcast a lot of times is that there's all these technology. It seems easy it could help you scale but on the surface but really underneath it it's not sustainable because over time if think of all the companies and uh, businesses that are reliant on facebook they don't have any sovereignty and i think sovereignty is one of the biggest issues um for business but tech that supports sovereignty supports entrepreneurial sovereignty i should say is i think maybe a scalable idea do you think VCs see this or do you think this, or do you see this? Like, I'm just, that's just you know, my I, thoughts. I, 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 I think you're, I think you're at the leading edge of where, where I think leading edge VCs and, are, are saying, look, uh, I mean, John Doerr was the bridge who kind of said, you know, we're going to do well by doing good. And, and so and that, I think most VCs are kind of on that page, but, but you're doing something deeper, I think, which is that um, these this this idea of sovereignty, this idea of, of institutionalizing venture change as a social power uh, that's funded through venture capital. One of the things you discover, by the way, is venture capital is much better at doing this than public capital. Public capital has so many restrictions and the, the consensus driven thing, it just, uh, unless you have a benevolent dictator, and we certainly have dictators and we certainly have benevolent people, but not very many <laughs> combine the two. Um, but but I mean, I, Absent that, venture capital can actually, and private action can move much faster than government action. Government action, however, can amplify. So what you really want is a private-public partnership where the private leads, innovates, takes risks, uh, and by the way, uh, makes a ton of money for itself. But even at making a ton of money for itself, it you know, it. I mean, Tesla, Musk has made a ton of money for himself, but he hasn't made a million vehicles yet. And I mean, and it's, so it, there's much more work to do. Governments can amplify that. And by the way, governments can also restrain it. I mean, as our friends at Apple and Amazon and Google and Facebook are now discovering, you know, when you take away sovereignty, people react, right? And they're going to say, no, we're going to reclaim our sovereignty at your, at your loss. I mean, the, the, that's why I think what you're saying is, is, is prescient because, yes, you can get to this scale, but you're, 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 you know, just like you have tech debt, you can have sovereignty debt or social debt or whatever it would mm. be. And Facebook has is, is got to pay down a boatload of social debt. And by the way, Uber, you know, the, is, is dealing with that uh, uh, as well. I think Airbnb has been pretty successful so far at staying on the right side of their social debt, but they, they gave a lot of thought to sovereignty. 
and, and the sovereignty of their hosts as well as as as, as, as the governments. So I, I think I think you've actually got a really important idea there, and I think the political the political social dimension at the beginning. I think all you have to worry about is just your values. But if you are successful and you start to scale at that point, you have to think about, okay, um, I I need to realize I'm scaling within a system and I need to honor the system within which I'm scaling and not just take advantage of the system. I think, I think the worst in the bubble is when we just, we co-opt, we, we, we gamed the system. And you you saw a whole bunch of key people coming out of, with an MBA coming out of school, wanting to game the system and, you know, dot com and, we have the pet smart you know puppet and the, the whole thing that was i was right in there and at all the trade shows <laughs> and i know exactly what you're talking about and i think that sting of that experience and and just my career of working with clients it's kind of left me with like yourself you know what what do i want to give to the world what what can i do and you know part of this podcast my book is is really about being a little bit of a guide to what's possible, not necessarily what is. I see threads of it. I see patterns. And so um, to me, I'm really just interested in this topic. And your book really resonated with me. I want to read it again and, and invite all of you that are listening. The Infinite Staircase is um, it's, it's a really intelligently written book. I mean, Jeffrey. When is, this- when is, when is Groundswell coming up? So i am actually got my draft um, okay. completed, my first draft. I just sent it to like Don Peppers and Joe yeah. Pine and stuff for review and comics. I, I mentioned them in the book. So as soon as it gets to editing, they'll let me know once um, they kind of make it, as you know, once they, <laughs> yeah, once they yeah, give that the go-ahead, then I'll <laughs> – but they're, they're saying to me it's going to be late spring, early summer, <laughs> which I thought was really aggressive. So I'm excited about that. I'm, well, because one of the things, I mean, I, the reason I have respect for your work is, is a lot of folks, I'm pretty good at stepping back, but you're pretty good at stepping in. And, 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 and you know, the world needs people to step in. <laughs> so oh, thank you. I want to thank you for your work. <laughs> right on. Well, thank you so much, Jeffrey. I hope that this this is the beginning of us doing maybe uh, a couple other uh, future podcast episodes. Um, and if you were so inclined, I'd love to give you my draft for comment. That'd be, I'd be be honored. I would love to see it. That'd be great. Oh, wow. Amazing. So with that, um, where can people follow you? Um, where would you like people to connect with you? So I, well, I think, I think LinkedIn is where it's the most obvious place. There is, there is a blog for the infinite staircase. Um, mind you, your note says it's not really a blog. Is that right? (laughs) That's the one. That's the one. Uh, and, and I'm, I think what I'm going to start doing there, I, I, I think I'm going to start doing this posting. Um, what's happened since I wrote it, and I've been talking with people a little bit, the kind of, these kind of conversations, is other philosophical topics have come up. And, I, and I'm at a stage where I just want to write. So I'm going to write a bunch of essays about, I'm writing one about aesthetics. I'm going to write one about free will, blah, blah. I mean, they're just classic philosophical topics. If you're a philosophy geek, I think it'll be interesting. If, Did you say aesthetics? A, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Did you say aesthetics, though? Yeah, aesthetics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I got so it. I, I know I got it. We're going to try to wrap up, but I want to know about that real quick. What's your thought there? Well, well, so so the issue with aesthetics is like, you know, people are trying to figure out where does, you know, it's very elitist. It's very about taste. It's all about art and whatever. And, I, and again, I'm trying to say, you know, our values come from below, not from above. And so aesthetics is all about getting back to what philosophers call qualia, these these nonverbal experiences that are very intimate and very subjective for us, and and most art history has tried to derive, try to take it from the top down. We have a theory of art, and eventually we get to explain qualia. And all I want to do is use the staircase to say, no, people, other way around. You experience qualia first as a baby. Babies experience qualia, and then you learn to talk about them later on. So I'm, it's that kind of stuff. It's, 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 Interesting. Well, one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to connect you, if you want, to Pauline Brown. She's the former chairman of uh, Louis Vuitton Group, and she wrote a book called Aesthetic Intelligence. Uh, oh, I've become quite book. close to her, and I think you two would have a great dialogue. I would love that. I would love that. Let's do that. Okay. Um, thank you for being on the show. Did you have something else you want to add real quick? No, no. I just want to say thank you for having me on the show. I really enjoyed the last hour. It was very enjoyable. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm so grateful for your time and attention. So everyone that's listening, thank you for being here. Again, 
This is another episode of the Groundswell Origins podcast. If you have a comment and you'd like to leave a, a voice, go to groundswell.fm, drop me a voice in my little voice pipe there and uh, go to my inbox and I'll send you one back. And until next time, mahalo. <laughs>